Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's world's most exciting classroom event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I will be your host for today. We have an action-packed uh, episode of the world's most exciting classroom coming your way today. There is a whole lot to catch up on on the Ooster Scale Day, the Darwin leaders, the projects happening in Uruguay right now. So let's dive right into it because we're going to cover a lot of content. So the first thing I want to do is just take a minute here to share my screen and let's figure out where the Ooster Scale Day is right now. So if you look at our map here on our website, darwin200.com, you can see that we have crossed the Atlantic and we've spent a lot of time here uh, along the coast of South America, mostly Brazil. Brazil is a massive country here. You can see the Amazon rainforest over on the left. And you can see where we've made our way from Fernando de Noronha here, that island up at the top. And then we've made our way to Salvador. We spent uh, over a week in Rio de Janeiro. And now we are making our, we've made our way actually to Punta del Este in Uruguay. So if I move us down here a little bit, you can get a little bit more of a feel for where we are, where the Ustrescalde is. And I'm going to come in a little bit tighter here. So you can see right here where we are. Uh, in Punta del Este. And then of course, we're always putting up little videos and clips from along the way. So here's a little video here uh, from sailing recently. We'll take a little bit of a look there. You can see some of the sails up, you can hear the wind. Uh, you can see the sun on the ocean. So it looked like some beautiful sailing uh, as we made our way along. Now, if some of you tuned in last week, you will know that we were testing out one of our new toys. So we have an ROV that we're using on board the ship. And as we go to different ports, visit different areas, we'll be putting in the water to see what we can find uh, beneath the ocean. And with any luck, we'll be able to live stream uh, from the ROV when we have good signals as well. So the big thing that happened with the ROV this time is we had some researchers on board, some marine biologists who really wanted to look at a seamount underwater a place that has never been explored before. Humans haven't seen it before. And the idea is to protect this area. Uh, Uruguay doesn't have a lot of marine protected areas. And if we could help gather some data with the ROV, then maybe we can bring things one step closer to being protected. So I have a little video queued up that I'm gonna play right now. Uh, and you can see what we were able to see when we were diving with the ROV last week. So let's get that up nice front and center and let's see what we saw. Okay, so these are our ROV operators. There's Rodri. Um, uh, so we have the ROV, um, which is in the water right now. There's an albatross uh, right there for you. Let's see if we can put this landscape. Um, there's an albatross right there. Uh, that tether line that is connected to the robot ROV. Sorry. And um, so we are imaging uh, all the fish and other marine creatures that we've got on this ridge right here. Um, and uh, it's really significant because this is an area that uh, we're trying to get protected uh, as an additional hope spot. So uh, there are uh, there are very few uh, marine protected well, let's see there are very few marine protected areas um, and we're hoping that this is going to be uh, Uruguay's newest addition to the um, protected zone okay so just to provide a little commentary that's how we have to launch the ROV you can see the Ooster Scalde has a relatively tall side so we kind of have to lower it over and then drop it in a little bit and you can see right away, we started seeing some life uh, over this seamount. You can see some beautiful, a nice beautiful school of fish here. Um, so the more images, the more data we can collect on this area, the more pieces we can fill in. So right now, what you were seeing in your classrooms is a part of the ocean that nobody has explored before. Divers haven't been in, uh, ROVs haven't been in the water. So really exciting to be able to be the first uh, to do this. So this is relatively shallow. We still have some pretty good light here uh, with the ROV in the water. And then we're going to take the ROV a little bit deeper because it's important to see what's living deeper in the water, what's living on the bottom. So the substrate, the ocean floor, what does it look like? Is it rocky? Um, is it sediment? So as you can see, we got deeper. We've got some a different species of fish here, a different school of fish. 
uh, as we go deeper, you can see it gets darker. And a little later in the video, we're gonna turn on the ROV's lights. So that's another really cool feature. So the ROV is a beautiful 4K camera, so we can capture some exciting images, but it also has lights. So when we go a little bit deeper, we can flick those lights on. And so you can see a school, a different species of fish here. You can see there's a lot of material in the water. Uh, and a lot of this kind of looks like it could be some zooplankton, uh, some plankton, so really tiny animal uh, and plant life. And as we get to the bottom, you can see it's a nice sandy substrate here. And you can see what looks like, I'm not 100% sure, this could be a little coral species or it could be little sponge species. So you can see even down here at the bottom where there's less light, there's still a lot of life here. So again, these images are so important for us to be capturing because we're the first ones to get a glimpse of the life that's down here. And the more we can collect, the more of a case can be made for the scientists, the marine biologists to have this as Uruguay's newest marine protected area of which they don't have a lot around the coast. So there's a tiny little bit left in the video. We're gonna get to see, we moved to kind of a little rockier spot with some boulders. Uh, and so you can kind of see a little bit of a different environment in the next video. And there's something slipping by there. It looks like a long fish, maybe an eel or something like a trumpet fish. You see it went by really quickly there. Now we're in this little rocky patch where it looks like possibly some coral or sponge uh, on it. There's a little sea star. So we were able to collect, I think, something like 300 gigabytes worth of footage with the ROV. So it's an incredible amount uh, of footage that we were able to collect. The marine biologists will be able to go through all of it, identify all the different species, hopefully that they uh, we were able to see, and then use all of that as another piece of the puzzle to help convince the government to make this a new uh, marine protected area. So really cool to get the ROV in the water for the first time and for it to be doing really important scientific work uh, for some of the conservationists that we are working with. All right, so let's keep things moving right along. We are in Punta del Este in Uruguay right now. Our Darwin leaders are getting out onto their projects. We have a full slate. Let me just read off some of these for you. We have conservation of Darwin's toad, conservation of Uruguay's coastal grassland ecosystems. We're looking at native forests, so the threats they face and monitoring biodiversity. We're looking at the impact of fishing on Uruguay's uh, sea turtles. We're looking at reducing plastic waste in the Rio de la Plata, conserving sharks in the waters of Uruguay. So that's the marine scientists uh, who we were doing the ROV dives for, rescuing sandy beaches, so looking at their biodiversity, and then protecting coastal lagoons and monitoring and managing urban development. So you can see it is absolutely jam-packed. Our Darwin leaders are slammed, and they're going to be producing a ton of amazing videos for us that we'll be releasing over the coming weeks. And then I think I see our expedition leader, Stuart McPherson. He is aboard the Uthuskelde right now, I believe. So let me see if we can get him in here with us. Hey, Stuart. Hello. It's lovely to see you, Joe. How are you? And I hope all of the students are very well. I'll do my talk both in English All right, looks like we had a little pause. Ah, there he is. Correcto. Ah. Hello, Joe, como estas? Todo bien? Yeah, very good, Stu. It's great to have you with us. We lost you for a second, but we got you now. Oh, fine, sorry. We're a little bit far from the ship. I'll get, I'll get better Wi-Fi and, and signal. We've got a, uh, the system on the ship. Well, it's lovely to speak to you today. Um, the ship at the moment has some wonderful visitors from the Rotary Club here in, uh, in Uruguay. So, hey, everyone. so we have a little bit of a guest audience today. Um, is that coming through okay? Can you hear me okay, Joe? Yeah, coming through nice and clear now, Stu. Oh, so I'm going to have to go a little bit further over here. Sorry, lost you into Is that coming through okay, Joe? Yeah, we got you nice and clear now. Oh, fine, perfect. Well, Uh, since the last world's most exciting classroom, the ship arrived off the coast of Uruguay and um, we've got eight amazing projects taking place here. You're going to hear about them in next world's most exciting classroom episode. It's a really misty day here in Punta del Este. If you look around, you can see. And um, the ship is extra mysterious in the mist. Here. <laughs> 
We've, we've got a really jam-packed program for you today. Um, I think it starts off with the, the giant tortoises on Galapagos. For the last few days, because I, I have to work six months ahead of the ship, for the last few days I've been in the Galapagos organising the projects that our new Darwin leaders in the Galapagos will be undertaking. So Joe, I think you've got a few clips now of the Galapagos to show and I'll talk through them and explain what we're up to and, and why we went there. Perfect. All right, here we go. <laughs> so, um, the conservation have to go and collect special plants called atoy for the Galapagos, for the giant Galapagos tortoises. And here's one of the conservationists cutting one of those big plants. This is a food plant for the giant tortoises. As you may know, many, many, many of these beautiful islands, these beautiful giant tortoises have been severely endangered. There's many species of them, one of which went extinct just a few, just a couple of years ago, called Lonely George. So there's many different projects for these black okay. tortoises, and one of them, our Darwin leaders, are going to be undertaking. They're, um, they're helping an amazing project called Guadalajara on San Cristobal, the, one of the main islands of the, the Galapagos Islands. And every single day, conservationists go out, collect food, and then bring them to here. This is a reserve um, to help the, the tortoises reproduce, and basically it's a safe population. And so what you can see here is those, um, those conservationists arriving with their food, putting them down on a feeding, feeding platform. And even though the tortoises move quite slowly, when they're hungry, they really can move. And they can weigh over 100 kilos, so you don't want to get in their way. Um, they're in sort of slow mode at the moment, but they really can go fast when they want to. I went there about a week ago, helping the conservationists, feeding the tortoises. And um, yeah, you can see them munching away on those leaves. This is specifically the San Cristobal species of giant tortoises. They can get really, really big, about the size of a wheelbarrow. And um, as you can see, they love these atoy plants. I love them. Watch your in my narration as well. Um, this is their favorite food. And they were all captured from Punta Pit, which is in the north of the island. Uh, there's one or two that local farmers ring up the rangers and say, I've got a tortoise on the farm, can you come and collect it? Because particularly dogs on farms will try and attack the, the tortoises. So it's a 12 hectare site. There's about 55 adult tortoises outside. And at the top, there's sort of uh, smaller cages with those that are sort of two to eight years old. And they're all numbered? So they're all numbered. Um, and then they do, a, do sort of a few checks during the year. How old can they live, do you think? Oh, well, I, well I, I think there's some on the island, they think of sort of 120 years plus. But there are others on other islands that I think probably 150 years plus. So, um, to explain this here, a very important part of the project is removing non-native species. But lots and lots of terrible plants, well, lovely plants, but don't belong there, such as lantana that have spikes that completely cover the habitat of the poor old tortoises and prevent breeding, such as this nest site here. So the conservationist, and I volunteered for a day, that was me macheteing there. The conservationist, uh, it, 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 it's very hard work, but they go in there with machetes, chainsaws, and kind of whippersnapper kind of um, have to have to remove all of those non-native plants. So you might say, well, why are you cutting down plants to conserve animals? But the plants are not native. They're not from the islands, the islands and they smother the habitats, they displace the natural foods of the tortoises. So it is actually a very, very, very important part of conserving and safeguarding those giant tortoises. Um, so that's one of the many projects we, we're bringing in lots of Darwin leaders to the Galapagos to do incredible projects, but that's not until April and May. So if you keep watching the world's most exciting classroom, we'll build up to that big, big, big event in the Galapagos and we'll go live with those giant tortoises and you'll be able to meet them um, in person and actually see them uh, in, in real time. So it should be really good fun. Well, we're continuing our work here in, um, in, Galapag in uh, Uruguay. 
We've got, say, eight projects currently taking place. One of them concerns an endemic toad called Darwin's toad. Another looks at sharks. Another looks at um, sea turtles off the coast of Uruguay. And another looks at um, the Pampa. It's a beautiful endemic eco native ecosystem here in Uruguay. So you're going to hear about those next week in the next week's session. So I'll hand back to Joe now. And from the, the good ship, Ustas Gilde. We look forward to welcoming you back next week. All right, Stuart, thanks so much for being with us. If you can stick with us for maybe another minute or two, let's just see if there's any shortest questions. So if you have any Pleasure. shortest questions, you can pop them into the chat. So there's the chat yeah. sidebar. I'll keep an eye out for those. We also have a few classrooms on camera, so I'll check in with them really quickly uh, and see with if pleasure. they have any tortoise questions. So Mr. Goulet's third graders are hanging out with us. Do you guys have any giant tortoise questions for Stuart before we let him go? Hi there. One of my students wondered if uh, the tortoises uh, attack each other or will eat each other. That's a really good question. They're herbivorous. They're herbivores. They eat plants, um, but they actually can get quite feisty. And do you know what? I, we'll, we'll put this video in for next week. I haven't got it with me, but I've got this hilarious video of one of them, especially when they're small. They push each other over. I've actually, someone sent me a video that happened just before I was there. Um, one of the tortoises sneaked up on another one, actually used his shell to push the other one over. He actually came back and righted the tortoise back onto his feet. So they, they, they have a bit of a sense of humor and they like to, to turn each other upside down and push them out the way. And um, we'll have that video ready for you next week. So if you want to join and see it next week, come back next week and we'll, uh, we'll show it to you. So yeah, they're very friendly. They all live together. In fact, in that conservation project, there's over 400 of them. They would never normally occur in such a concentration in nature, um, but because they feed them artificially with those plants to help bolster the population, because it's only a, a fraction of what it naturally would be. Um, yeah, they all live very close together, but no, they're generally friends. They don't eat each other. All right, Stuart, I've got a question from a class in Portugal and they're wondering yeah. um, where you were, what do you think the yep. oldest tortoise was and what was the name of that mate, that plant yeah. that they were eating? Um, so the plant is called Atoy. It's actually an alocasia, taro, um, from, um, from, from Southeast Asia. So it's also not native to the Galapagos Islands, but the, the tortoises really love it. So they plant that plant to, uh, to feed it to those tortoises. Um, so it's quite nice in that regard. In regards to the age, what no one really knows how old they can be. However, um, there's a different tortoise called Jonathan on the island of St. Helena. I've actually already met him. I did a TV documentary series there a few years ago. And we on the Darwin 200 voyage are going back to St. Helena, but not until um, about April, 2025. So you will meet Jonathan. Jonathan is really special. He's the oldest land animal alive today. No one actually knows exactly how old he is, but he was definitely on the island in the 1830s, 1840s. So he's, you know, he's 170 plus years old. And that's the oldest land animal alive today. There are definitely older animals in the sea, like Greenland sharks. They could be 400, 500 years old. Um, but in terms of land animals, Jonathan is the oldest, tortoise, oldest animal alive anywhere in the world on land. Um, the Galapagos tortoises certainly live for hundreds of years, certainly 200, uh, 150 plus years. So it's amazing to think that those little tortoises um, that we see there today will be alive 150 years from now, easily. All right. We'll try one more question. Linwood Public School is with us. They joined a little bit late, so they might not have a question, but I'll check with them really quickly uh, just to see Linwood Public School. Do you have a question for us? Yeah. If you do, unmute your mic. Otherwise, we'll get you for the shark stuff. Uh, That's shortly. okay. That's all right. Okay. We'll get them for the shark stuff uh, in a couple minutes. Stuart, yeah. thank you so much for joining us. We're going to hop to pleasure. Uh, in the UK very or, or next, but maybe we can get Perfect. one more look at the ship. Uh, of course, that's a good idea. Before we sign off today. You know what? That is an excellent idea. I should have um, thought of that myself, actually. You're right. Um, so the ship is 50 meters long, which is actually longer than Charles Darwin's vessel, the Beagle. The Beagle was 
from memory about 34 meters long and it had twice as many people so it's much more crammed if you look up there some of the crew are actually at work hi guys they're cleaning the ship right now as you can see it's a full-time job maintaining the ship they have to they're non-stop varnishing painting fixing things the crew are incredibly hard working so here's the vessel So, um, yeah, that's the ship then. The, the three masts are right there. But there's, there's also some of the crew right up at the top of the mast. I'm not sure if you can see them right up there. It really is an absolutely full-time job doing this. It's non-stop work for them. So um, they're, uh, they're an incredible team, the crew. So thank you so, so much for letting me join you today. It was an absolute pleasure. And um, speak soon. All right. Sweet Thanks, next Stuart. Week. Have a great rest of the day. It was great to see you. Thank you. Cheers. Okay. So we are going to jump now to the other side of the Atlantic, and we're going to spend a little time uh, with the National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth with the Ocean Conservation Trust. And they prepared a great little lesson exploration uh, of sharks for us. We've got Jess standing by. So let's bring her in. Hey, Jess, how you doing? I'm really good, Joe. Thank you. Yeah, we have absolutely loved making all those sorts of this. Excellent. Well, Jess, I'm excited to dive into the aquarium to learn about sharks. Uh, so yeah, and then we'll do a little Q&A after. Wonderful, thank you, Jen. So, hi everybody and welcome. I am stood in front of our Atlantic Ocean tank. This is the deepest tank in the whole of the United Kingdom. It's got two and a half million liters of water. So that means that if you had a bath, a full bath, every single day for 85 years, that is how much water you would use. Pretty impressive. We've got 10 different species, sorry, 10 different sharks in this tank, a few different species. I'm going to move out of the way slightly and see if we can spot any. I think if we look all the way up there, you might just see one of our sand tiger sharks. Beautiful, that looks like Yushaka. She's our largest sand tiger shark. And down here, her brother, Mandela. And a nurse shark coming along behind him too. Now we've got an extra special treat for you today, gang, because what we're gonna do is take you to the top of this tank. We're gonna show you behind the scenes, and I'm gonna introduce you to one of the wonderful people who help us take care of these beautiful animals. So Joe's got a little bit of footage for us that he's going to play uh, where you can see some of them being fed and we'll join you up there in a minute.
that's really exciting. Um, so to start us off, we've just been looking at some of the sharks we've got downstairs, and today there's a real theme with the Dome 200 project uh, about sharks. So can you tell us, to start us off, how on earth do you go about feeding a shark? Um, so there's lots of different methods that we use to feed the sharks. So sometimes we'll use a spear, sometimes we'll use tongs, um, sometimes we even feed them, and sometimes we use little enrichment devices from the sink. So sorry, just to jump in quickly, Jess, uh, when Isla answers the questions, can we get a little bit closer so we can hear just because there's a little bit of aquarium noise? Yeah, you know, the aquarium noise. I can turn some of it off. Yeah, there's a quick thing to do. That sounds amazing. I think you can see as a biologist, you have to be able to switch tack and do so many different things really quickly. We were wondering just to show you some of the animals you can see in this tank. So you might just be able to catch a glimpse down here of Friday the turtle. No, he's moved on. But our sharks as well, right at the top over there. Brilliant. Thank you, Isla. That should be a bit better. Um, should we try that one again? So with the feeding of the sharks and, and what these are, can you talk us through that feeding process for the big animals? Yeah, so especially for our big animals, it's really important that we know how much they're eating because we can use that data, that information, to understand their health and understand um, if there's anything we need to change. Um, it also helps, so one part of the things that we do so that we can monitor who, which individuals eating how much food is something called target training. So we do target train a lot of our sharks, which people would not usually um, believe, but they are actually very easy to train because they're very food motivated. So here we have a load of different targets and they're all trained to swim up to their own work. So starting with our most basic one, this is just a straightforward target um, target um, hole. So the animal, this is for our groupers. So the animals need to swim to the target and they get food from here. For our bigger sharks, our sandbars, see that white square over there? So when it's feeding time, they know the black spot is where they get their food. So they will swim up to it and we will give them their food. And it means, um, yeah, so for our, another thing, a really cool thing, I really love this piece, for our little sharks, so this one, we will actually move it around in the water and they have to follow it in order to get the reward. And this is a really important thing to be able to train them to do because it means that if we do need to give them treatment or isolate them or separate them, they know that they just follow it. So we have already initiated that learning of following it means food so it means that easily instead of jumping in the tank and catching the animal which is quite stressful and hard work we can just lure them somewhere this is also a more advanced piece of training so a long time ago we actually started training the nurse sharks to swim into a stretcher which actually would make our job even easier if we did need to so this is a clicker um a clicker you might have, if you have any experience with dog training you'll probably have used this before um, this is just an extra thing you can do in training. So they have the target and they get the reward. But to make them do more complex behaviours, you associate this, the click, as a bridge. So it means they've done the behaviour, but the reward is coming. So it just means you can extend that behaviour and that reward so that they, uh, they get it. That's really good. Fantastic. Um, and I was saying how important it is that we know exactly how much the animals have eaten. And am I right thinking that's in case uh, there's any changes in case they're starting to get ill or anything like that? Yes, yeah, so um, we've done it quite a lot. So when we have um, pregnancies, um, we have a good, or we have a database that spans years and years back all these individual animals. And if we think all well, something's not right, we can have a look on the database and see, did it, is this a pattern that changes throughout the year? And we can see, oh, maybe it's just a time of year. Or, oh, maybe they might be pregnant. Um, and, and then we can use it to say, um, if something does rapidly stop eating and we can see that it's not normal, it means that we can catch it and, and um, take a hold of the situation faster. That's really cool. I love that idea, pregnant sharks, if we could get some baby sharks. So just to show you guys, every morning, our biologists, two people take two hours, so four hours in total to prepare the food for the whole aquarium. And all the food is put for the animals into these things like sort of their own little lunchbox. So they might have a tub like this one with their names. This is Junior's, one of our nurse sharks. 
Uh, some of them have got normal Tupperware boxes with all their names on top as well. Um, and feeding sharks is really interesting. It says that they have to have special vitamins, don't they? Yes, yes. Um, because um, we feed them frozen food and um, it works with humans as well. If you eat frozen vegetables, it's never quite the same as fresh vegetables. And um, so we do have to freeze some of our food because it's not possible to get it fresh every day. And that means you lose some of the good bits in the food, the nutrients. So in order to supplement that, we have some specially designed supplements, a bit like vitamins for humans, that are specially designed for sharks to make sure that we keep them as healthy and happy as possible. Brilliant. Um, there's lots and lots of record keeping with uh, with husbandry, with biology, uh, being a marine biologist. We keep records of all the animals, all the food is weighed before it's given to them. And we keep track of how much they've eaten, just so they've got all that data that they need. Um, but the other things that are really, really interesting to know about how we care about our animals, the thing that I feel really exciting, excited about is when they do that, for the sand tiger sharks in particular, they have got to have incredible ability to identify the species and identify the individuals too. So over here, you can see a board and this features our three sand tiger sharks. And it gives them a few tips for how to identify them because they'll have their lunch boxes here on the side. And as the sand tiger shark approaches, they'll have a target in one hand. They'll have a litter picker told in the other and they've got to be able to pick the food from the right lunch box and drop it in the water as a shark approaches. And it needs to be the right shark. So they need to be able to make that identification so quickly. It amazes me every single time I see it. I wondered if anybody's got any questions for Ina about that today. All right. So uh, fair game right now in the chat. If you have any questions, you can put them into the chat if you're tuning in live. I'll also check in with our classrooms uh, who are in camera spots and see if they have some questions for us. But let's start first. Uh, we have Beth and Miles in the UK, and they'd really like to know, why is it that the sharks don't eat uh, the other fish in the aquarium? So um, one of the big things about this database that we have is we can monitor how hungry they are. So we always make sure to make sure they're as full as possible so uh, we do feed them three times a week for the big sharks because in the wild they wouldn't eat every day. Um, and we make sure that we update and evaluate how much they're eating to make sure that um, none of the natural shark behaviors happen in our tanks. <laughs> um, so it's very rare that it does happen because we feed them um, yummy, nutritious food that they don't have to chase for. They just have to swim past and collect. All right. Uh, another question here uh, about how much truth is there to sharks being able to smell blood in the water? Um, first hand knowledge, just from working with these guys, you can really see it. So some of our sharks, they don't really have very good eyesight. And you notice this because some of them, although sometimes it's stubbornness, some of them won't be able to see the target if it's, it's too far away. However, if there's a bit of food dropped and they swim past it, they might not see it, but you can literally see them Twigging. oh there's something around here and it could be half a meter away it could be a meter away from them they obviously can't see it but you can see their reaction instantly turns around and they will circle around till they collect the food so uh, i do believe they have a really cool sort of okay another question here in the chat and then we'll visit a couple classrooms uh is about you guys said you have a 10 sharks species about how many do we think there are in the world Sorry, that was a slip of the tongue on my part. It was 10 sharks and four different species. Ah, okay. I was getting ahead of myself, but I'll pass on to Isla. I don't know, that's a tough question. I believe there's about 250 species of sharks. Uh, that may or may not be correct. Um, they vary from absolutely massive ones to whale sharks to really, really small ones, like a cookie cutter shark. Okay, let's take a little check in here with uh, some of our camera groups. Let's go to Linwood Public School. How are we doing today, Linwood? Oh, can you grab the mute for me? Perfect. Hi there, we're doing great. Uh, our students were wondering how many sharks are in the tank. Okay, so we've got 10 sharks in total. So we've got three beautiful sand tiger sharks. They're the really big ones with pointy noses. We have got two sand bar sharks. They're a lot shorter, they've got flat noses. They look a bit like they've smacked into the side of the tank. 
Uh, and then we have got uh, four nurse sharks, which are really special because they've got these very cool buccal pumps, so they can actually lie still on the floor, um, which a lot of shark species can't do. And my personal favourite, Zeus the zebra shark. You may have seen him swim past a minute ago. He is a very, a very smooth swimmer, and he's got beautiful spots all over him. Doesn't seem to make sense that he'd be a zebra shark, but the reason for that is that when they are young, when they're babies, like the example here that you can see, they're actually all stripy. And we believe that this is an adaptation that they have that makes them look a little bit like sea serpents, which are uh, really poisonous and not something you want to mess with. So the belief is that these zebra shark young are striped like this to protect them. And as they get older and they get bigger, those uh, stripes, they shrink and they become little spots like our brain up Zeus. All right, Linwood, do you have one more shark question for us? No pressure, we can swing back too uh, and see if there's another one. All right, Mr. No. Goulet's third graders are hanging out with us. Let's see if they have uh, a shark question or two for us. A couple questions. Uh, one is, Will sharks eat each other? And um, what is this specific type of food that they're actually being fed at the aquarium? Like, what is it? Is it fish? Is it jellyfish? We're just wondering about that. So um, none of our species are really cannibalistic species of sharks. There are a few species that have been identified. I mentioned earlier hooky cutter sharks. Now, they don't eat each other. But if you ever see, they do it to dolphins, they do it to whales, they do it to other sharks. You'll see little circles, and that's why they can quickly become cookie cutters, because they'll latch on, twist, and take a, uh, a little slab of tissue, um, and they'll eat that. Um, cannibalism uh, in sharks, uh, I don't think it's a massive problem. They do, when they are reproducing, it is quite violent, and it does almost look like they're eating each other. Um, but it's it, they're not eating each other, it's just part of the... Interaction. Um, I forgot what the second food it was. What? Oh, so the food. So um, we do give them a variety of different foods depending on the animals. So our sand tigers will eat about three kilos of food every meal time. So that will include we have some things called dirty squid, which is a bit bigger than your normal squid. Um, we give them mackerel. We give them um, small trevally slash tuna things. Um, haddock, whiting. Um, some of our other fish will get octopus. Um, normal, other sharks, sorry, we'll get normal squid, um, they'll get sardines, herring, um, we give them quite a lot of sour and stuff, depending on what they like, because obviously they do have personalities and we do have preferences, so we know this shark likes this stuff, so we maybe lean towards giving them more of that stuff. All right, I've got one more question uh, for you today. Someone would be curious to know, do sharks sleep? How do they rest? That's a really good one. Um, so for our nurse sharks and our zebra sharks, sometimes you can see them. So in the morning when we come into work, they'll be fast asleep on the bottom because they can lie in that benthic stage, um, like Jess said, with the buccal pumping. However, with our um, pelagic sharks, which means they stay in the open ocean or just more around the water column, um, an example of this is our sand tigers. So you can see them swimming about normally, but what's really eerie is if you ever see them, when they're asleep, they move so slowly. So they stay in the column and they stay moving, but they're moving so slowly. And it is really interesting to see because you're just like, whoa, uh, it just doesn't move. Really. Okay, I can't resist sticking one more question in because I think this is a good one. Where do the sharks come from in the aquarium? Are you capturing them from the wild or are some of them bred in, the, in captivity? Um, so, all of our sharks, I believe, are bred in captivity. Um, our sand tigers, we have two that were actually born in, um, in South Africa. I think it might have been one of the first cases of, I think it was artificial insemination. Um, it may, that may not be correct. But, um, so they were born um, in South Africa and then they came up to us. We have other sharks, for example, El Diablo. Um, he was in another aquarium. But it was a smaller tank and he's got a very large personality. So they reached out to us and said, look, we're having problems with the shark. Are you able to take him? Um, so uh, we took him on. So in this industry, 
we uh, communicate with a lot of other places um, and we'll rotate animals to keep the genetics um, wide enough um, so that we don't have to take from the wild. All right. Well, Isla, um, oh, there's a little shark view there. Very cool. Uh, Isla, Jess, and I believe Georgia behind camera, thank you so much for taking us to the National uh, Marine Aquarium in Plymouth today. Uh, Ocean Conservation Trust, you guys do such amazing work. Thank you so much for spending some time with the world's most exciting classroom today. Thank you, Joe. You're very welcome. Can I do a quick plug for our Yeah, team? of course. Excellent. Thank you. If you'd love to hear more about El Diablo's story and actually Friday, the turtle and many of the other incredible animals that we've got here on the BBC, we've currently got a behind the scenes TV series. It's called Behind the Scenes at the Aquarium on the BBC. Um, and we'd love it if you would take a look. Very, very cool. Thank you so much for being with us today. We got our little behind the scenes peek, but I bet there's a lot more to see. So thank you so much uh, for being with us today. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so we have a little special treat. I believe Stuart is back with us. Let me see if I can get him back in here. Oh, it looks like his camera might have froze on us, but Stuart has some visitors on the ship. So we're going to say hi to them really quickly. Uh, and then we're going to do our experiment uh, of the week. So let's just give it a second. Here. Oh, there he is. Hey, Stuart. That's better. That's good, sir. So, oh, we're getting a bit feedback. Not sure what they Can you um, hear me, Stuart? Is that better? There's. So it's going to come back to uh, Since. Oh, I'm not sure what's going on. Can you fix it? No? Uh, unfortunately, I can't. I think it, it's something on your end. Let me try and okay. cut myself away and see if that helps. Hold on. Okay, just that's better. Okay, I know what's going on. Okay. All right, so I think Stu had multiple windows open. So I think he's gonna quickly try and close them and just have one window. Uh, you're gonna get a little view of the saloon in the Oosterskelde. So let's get Stuart back in there. Hey, I'm Stu. So, sorry guys, I had a browser open on my, my phone as well as uh, StreamYard, so sorry about that. Since I was talking to you about the giant tortoises, we've had, well, Quantos Estanis did it, Quantos Nino. We've had 60 kids join the ship. Um, a little bit of a surprise. So here they all are. Hey, everyone. Um, say hi, everyone. I've got a class. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe do you guys have any questions about the bar, the ship? Can you tell us unos preguntas sobre el barco? Unos. Come on. Can you tell us unos preguntas? Hoy le preguntaron. Yeah. Hacía cuántos años que se había construido este barco? So we had a question, how old is the ship? Uh, I'll say it in English and Espanol. Voy a hablar en English y en Espanol. So la, pre la pregunta es, ¿cuántos años tiene el barco? The question is, how old is the ship? Well, this ship, believe it or not, is a very historic ship. It was built in 1917. So it has 105 years old. Este barco estaba construyendo en el año 1900. Yes. Yeah, well remembered. So it's 100, over 105 years old. It was originally a cargo ship. Perhaps would any of the kids watching like to ask these kids from Uruguay any questions? Maybe about nature or animales? Do you guys have any questions? I I need to in otro países. ¿Quieren ustedes una pregunta? Sí. ¿De qué continente son? No entiendo. Oh, 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 qual paises? Joe, we've got a question. How, which schools, which countries have we got schools from joining today? Oh, that's a great question. So we have uh, schools joining us in Canada. We have schools joining us in the United States. Nice. We have schools in the UK, like Scotland uh, and in England. We have uh, a school in Portugal joining us today. Okay. Uh, and it looks like a school in uh, Germany joining us today. Niños, hay escuelas. Ustedes hablan con escuelas en los Estados Unidos, en Canadá, en Reino Unido. No, sí, Portugal, Alemania. Yeah, ahora, right now, ahora. Sí, ahora. Yeah, sí. 
ejemplo, si tienen alguna, yeah. algún estudio acá sobre las ballenas ¿Sí? que, que vienen a reproducirse yeah. acá en Punta del Este. Yeah, absolutamente. Pueden contar por sí. qué, yeah. el periodo. Yeah. So we've got a question about the projects that we're doing here in, in uh, Uruguay. We have yeah. eight projects. Tenemos ocho proyectos aquí. We have eight projects. One on the Darwin's toad, an endemic toad, el sapito de Darwin. Uh, one on the pampa, the beautiful pampa ecosystem, la pampa. One on um, tuberones, on sharks. Uh, one on uh, the bosque, the forest. One on the grasslands. Um, un otro on... A Another one on plastic, plasticos marinos. Um, see, so I ocho proyectos in total. Yeah, so we've got eight amazing projects happening here in Uruguay. And next week, we'll give you a good summary of them. So, Stuart, well, uh, yeah. the classroom in Portugal would like to know, can the students yeah. tell us some of the animals that they see? Okay, guys, um, I estudiantes in Portugal que quieren saber si ustedes conozcan animales de Uruguay. Yeah. So, okay. One, one at a time. Poco a poco. So. I think we might have so we've got that. armadillos. Okay. Yep. El, ¿Cómo se llama? El terro. An ave, a oh, type of bird. I'm afraid I'm not up to my uh, uh, Spanish Uruguayan names here. So, a speed bird. An yeah. otro animal. What is another one? See. Um, a gallineta. A gallineta. Okay, tipo tipo a, a bird. Oh, es, es, um, es rosa? Or no? No. Flamingo? No, 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 Hay un otros animales aquí de Uruguay? Otro animales? Yeah. What's your animal? ¿Qué es tu animal? No sé. Oh, come on. Oso? ¿Es el oso? Lobo? Okay. A type of wolf. A lobo. A lobo. Well, it's probably time we say goodbye here. I've got to continue my tour of the ship. So, All right. Niños, say goodbye to Hasta luego. Hasta luego. Three, two, one. Bye. Yes. yes. Bye. 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 All right. Thank <laughs> you. We'll catch up with you later. Uh, okay. Bueno. Okay. All right. Well, we have to get to our Kahoot. So if you were paying attention to the little bit about the tortoises and the sharks, we're going to have a little Kahoot quiz for you. Um... And as always, the top student will receive a 50 pound uh, Amazon gift card. So we're gonna have four questions today, a little bit of true and false, uh, a little bit of multiple choice. The quicker you can get your answer in, and if it's right, the more points you are going to get. So let me share my screen really quickly here, share screen, uh, and you can see where you need to go. You need to go to kahoot.it. Zero one nine one. Once you put that in, you'll be given an animal name and you will be ready to go. If you have a computer at your desk, maybe you have a Chromebook or a tablet, you can join there. If not, no big deal. Uh, your teacher could put up at the front of the room and you could yell out your answers to him or her. If you're at home, you could scan that QR code with your phone or with your tablet and that will bring you into the event as well. So some of these ones, like the brave snail, the clever tiger, the bold deer, it could be an individual student, it could be an entire classroom. Either way, it is great to have you joining us, uh, and we are going to do our questions. Again, you've got 20 seconds for each question. There's a little bit of true and false, a little bit of multiple choice. If you were paying attention today, you will be ready to go. After we finish our Kahoot, we are gonna have our experiment, and then we will wrap up today's event with our curiosity of the week. Can you guess what this week's curiosity is? So that is the remainder of our event together. I told you the world's most exciting classroom is a busy place uh, and I think we're ready. I don't see any more groups joining. So I am going to start our Kahoot quiz. 
there will be three seconds to count you in and get you ready. And the questions focus on tortoises and they focus on sharks. So here we go. First question, about how long might a Galapagos tortoise live? Was it 10 years, 35 years, 60 years, or all the way up to 150 years? So about how long could those giant tortoises live? 10 years, 35 years, 60 years, or all the way up to 150 years. Ooh, we had a bit of a mixture there, but it is 150 years. So uh, the conservationist mentioned that some of them on the island, he was on San Cristobal, about 120 years old, uh, but on some of the other islands, up to 150 years old. Very cool. So the quick cheetah is in first place. We have a true and false coming your way. Invasive plants are not an issue in the Galapagos. Only animals, only invasive animals. Is that true or is that false? So plants that don't belong, invasive plants, are not an issue in the Galapagos. Is that true or is that false? It's got a couple more seconds. All right, it is absolutely false. There are invasive animals, but there's also invasive plants. And we saw a little video clip uh, of Stuart working to remove some of those plants. They put them to work uh, for the day. The quick cheetah is holding on to that top spot. We are gonna go to another true and false. The National Marine Aquarium has four different species of sharks. Is that true or is that false? The National Marine Aquarium has four different species of sharks. You can see one of them there. That's a sand tiger shark. They definitely had those. But was it four species or more? How many species did they have? All right. So it is true. They have four species. They misspoke at the beginning and said 10, but it's four species and 10 uh, sharks in total. So that puts the mighty duck into first place. And we have our last question. Which shark species is the largest in the world? Is it the great white? Is it the whale shark? Is it the tiger shark? Or is it the bull shark? You're getting a clue there as the picture is slowly being revealed as well. Is it a great white shark, a whale shark, a tiger shark, or a bull shark? A couple more seconds. All right, it is absolutely that whale shark. So a whale shark can be up to 60 feet long, so as big as a school bus. Next time you see a bus, think about a shark that big. Now, even though they're really big, they eat some of the smallest things in the ocean. They're filter feeders. They eat tiny little fish, tiny little zooplankton. They filter it out of the water. So largest fish in the world, largest shark is the whale shark but they are little tiny creatures that they like to eat. So in third place, we've got the flying lark. In second, we've got the bronze egret and holding down that top spot, who do we have? Let's see, the mighty duck was able to hold on for the last two questions. All right, well, thank you so much for playing Kahoot with us. If you are that mighty duck, I am going to put uh, an email address up on the screen. So ebtsoyp at gmail.com. You can also find the email address afterwards, ebtsoyp at gmail.com. Send me a message and we will make sure that we get uh, that Kahoot card coming your way. Now, we have to take a look at the results from uh, our last experiment. So for those uh, who were tuning in, you know that we were looking at photosynthesis in plants and we had a really cool experiment. So let's take a minute now and see the results of that experiment. Welcome back. How did your photosynthesis experiment go? Well, I can see my one has produced lots and lots of bubbles. You'll notice that the bubbles slowly emerge from the pondweed. They all collect in the funnel and then they congregate and sort of rise up into this test tube. And I can see my test tube's actually floating. This gas inside the test tube should be pure oxygen. You might remember 
that photosynthesis is a very important reaction. It's the process by which plants use sunlight, or in this case, the light of the lamp, to transform carbon dioxide and water into glucose and oxygen. So all of those little bubbles that we can see emanating from the pondweed, that should be pure oxygen. This simple little process is so important for life on Earth. This is because the oxygen that plants produce is a waste product for the plant, but essential for animals like you and I to survive on. We breathe oxygen, and without plants producing oxygen through photosynthesis, there wouldn't be enough oxygen in our atmosphere for us to survive. It's amazing to think that all around us, every green leaf on a tree and blade of grass is slowly and silently photosynthesizing during the daytime and producing oxygen which we need to breathe. How did you get on with your experiment? Did you have results similar to mine? Did your pond we produce more oxygen or less? Maybe you used a different species. Maybe it was more efficient or less efficient. Or maybe you had a brighter light. All right, everyone, it is time for our brand new experiment of the week. And we are going to do it right here in uh, my basement studio. So what we're going to do is still sticking to biology. We're going to take a little look at yeast and one of the biological processes that it undergoes when it is eating. So we have a really cool experiment that you can easily replicate uh, in your classroom or you could replicate the experiment at home. So a little bit about yeast to get us started. It was discovered by Louis Pasteur uh, to be a living organism. He found that in 1857. Now yeast, there are about 160 known species uh, and it's very, very tiny. So in one gram, there can be 25 billion uh, cells. So let's explore how yeast eats, how yeast feeds. And the best way to do that is to do a little switcheroo here with uh, my camera view. So there we go. You should be able to see my hands here, nice front and center. And we're going to talk about the materials that we are going to need for this experiment. First thing you're going to need is three balloons. You don't have to be anything special. I've got happy birthday balloons here. Any balloon should work just fine. Maybe not the really thin ones where you make balloon animals. You want one that you can blow up and make a nice circle with. So we need three of those balloons. We need three bottles. So water bottle, Gatorade bottle, pop bottle, whatever works for you. You can use one of these bottles and you don't want it to be bigger than a liter. So small liter, maybe even smaller will work uh, even better. So a nice water bottle, I think they're around 500 to 600 milliliters. Those are a good fit. You need some sugar. We've got some of that right there. And then what you're gonna need as well is some warm water. So 105, 115 degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere in that area, nice and warm uh, coming from your tap. And finally, you need the yeast. And you might be thinking, well, where am I gonna find some yeast? Well, head to your grocery store. Uh, very easy to find in the baking section. Yeast is a very important ingredient uh, for making bread. So there we go. You can find that at your grocery store. So what are we going to do? We are going to take our balloon to start and we're gonna blow it up a few times. We're gonna stretch it out, really stretch it out, blow it up like that. Let the air out. We're really gonna do that a few times because we want it to be nice and loose, uh, our balloons. So blow them up a few times. Then we are going to take our bottles of water and in each of them, we are going to put some of the warm water. So maybe something like two inches in the bottom uh, of that nice warm water in all three bottles. Then in the first bottle, that's all we're gonna do. We're gonna take our balloon, we're gonna stretch out the top and we are gonna put it over top like that. And we're done with that one. In our second bottle, we are going to add the yeast to the water. After that, we will put the balloon on top. In our third bottle, we will have the water, we'll have the yeast, and then we're gonna add sugar. So maybe two tablespoons of sugar into the top before we put the balloon on. After that, we will take all three of our bottles and put them somewhere warm. Maybe you have a window in your classroom or at home uh, where you can put it in the sun or something like a radiator or a heat register, you could leave the balloon 
uh, the bottle with a balloon there. Then we're going to leave it and check up on it. So 15 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, and see what is happening to the balloon. Is it inflating on all the bottles or some of them? What is going on? You want to record your results. What happens with bottle one, bottle two, and bottle three? Then we're going to have three questions for you to answer. The first one is, which bottle had the best results? So which one inflated the balloon the most? Was it bottle one with just water, bottle two with water and yeast, or bottle three with water, yeast, uh, and sugars as well? And why do you think that happened? Number two, what biological process do you think is taking place? So carbon dioxide is what is filling that balloon. What biological process is taking part to make that happen? And finally, what role does yeast play in the baking of bread? We know we can find this yeast in our baking uh, aisle at the grocery store, but why? What role does it play in the baking of bread? So there we go. That is your challenge for this week to get the yeast feeding and see what happens in your three bottles, your water, your water and yeast, and your water and sugar. You could do this, water, yeast, and sugar. You can do this at school, you can do this at home. Send us in some pictures, and then the answer to those three questions, and you wanna send those to classroom at darwin200.com. So classroom at darwin200.com, Send us some pictures, send us the answer to those questions. You can find this video uh, on the Darwin 200 YouTube if you wanna look at it again. Then on the website, you can find the video with a little PDF that explains what we're doing and what the three questions are. You have two weeks to submit your answers and the top three responses will get a 50 pound Amazon gift card. Thank you so much for joining us for the experiment and we look forward to seeing your results. And we're going to wrap up with our curiosity of the week. So we're going to play uh, last week's curiosity and see what the answer was. And then we will take a look at this week's curiosity before we sign off for today. I asked you to try and identify these curiosities. Could you work out what they are? Well, let's have a little look at them. They're fibrous, We've got a husk on the outside. There is something on the inside. In fairness, I guess it's a bit of a trick question because you wouldn't know what's inside of them. However, this one here, luckily, comes apart. If you look very carefully, there's a giant nut inside. It's not actually a true nut, but it's called a nut. Can you guess what this is? To give a little bit of a clue, there's some white edible substance inside this hollow section with a liquid as well. Yes, you guessed it, it's a coconut. Coconuts don't grow as those little brown balls that you often see in shops. The coconuts actually grow inside these fibrous husks. These husks are really good for floating. Coconuts are a coastal species in the tropics, so these nuts often fall down into the ocean and float off and colonize a new location or a new island. The white coconut flesh, as it's often called, that's really delicious, lines the inside of this hard shell. And the coconut liquid, or milk as it's sometimes named, fills that hollow section inside. So if you guessed a coconut, you're absolutely right. Well done if you guessed correctly. And now let's find out what this week's curiosity is and see if you can identify it. All right, let's do that. Let's look at this week's curiosity. Back. This week's curiosity is this object here. Now I know it looks a bit rude, a bit like someone's bottom, but this is a serious curiosity. Can you guess what this strange looking object might be? Send in your best guesses to classroom at darwin200.com. Join next week and find out the identity of this very strange, mysterious object. All right, so you have one week to send in your answer to what you think the curiosity is. You will send that to the same spot, classroom at darwin200.com. So one week for the curiosity and two weeks for the experiment. And I know that when the camera switched views, I think the audio might have been lost for some people. So I will make sure it's uploaded with the full audio. So if you visit the Darwin 200 um, site, the YouTube, you will see that the full audio will be there for you. 
uh, and then you can check out the experiment and try it in your classroom. Thank you so much to all the students who joined us live today, but also a huge shout out to our sponsors and partners, without whom we wouldn't be able to do the world's most exciting classroom. We wouldn't be able to sail around the world with the Ooster Scow Day uh, and bring the young Darwin leaders with us and share such amazing content with you. So as we always do, we will wrap up with a little video to say thank you to uh, our sponsors and our partners. Thanks so much, everyone.